Welcome to the first panel of the Asia PEBC Summit 2022. We're here to talk about how private equity players in Asia are looking to ride out the current uh, turbulent times as the threat of a recession looms large. Uh, with me are some of the leading investors in the region who are going to talk about the lessons they've learned from previous down cycles and how they see exits, uh, opportunities uh, in the current environment. But first, a quick introduction, if we could start with you, Kenneth. Yeah, so uh, Kenneth Chong, I'm a Managing Director in Singapore. I lead the uh, Southeast Asian Investment Program. Uh, I sit on the Investment Committee as well, and I've been with the firm for about 25 years. Thank you. Nanish? Hi, uh, I'm Nanish Jaising, a founding partner and CEO of Affirma Capital. We spun out of Standard Chartered Bank in 2019. We manage over $3 billion across Asia and Africa and the Middle East. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Eddie. Uh, I work for Sea Town Holdings. Uh, we are an absolute return uh, multi-strategy firm. Uh, I, we both have the public market products and the private market products. I cover the private market products, both in the credit space and in the private equity space. Good morning. My name is Doug Coulter. I'm the head of private equity for, uh, in Asia Pacific for LGD Capital Partners. We're a global alternatives firm, uh, mostly managing private equity. Today, we manage $85 billion of PE. Uh, in Asia, it's around $8 billion committed and invested, uh, with China being our largest market. We're Hong Kong headquartered, but we invest across Asia Pacific, including Southeast Asia. Thank you. Let's start with the first question. How do you see the current down cycle being different or similar to previous down cycles? And what lessons from the previous ones are you applying to this one? And Kenneth, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think each down cycle is slightly different. I think if we look at um, you know, uh, what's happening with this current down cycle, it's a function of a number of events. You know, the high CPI that, uh, that the US is encountering and all this is uh, a function of uh, you know, what has happened over the last few years where you had uh, quantitative easing, the Fed reducing interest rates, uh, you have, uh, you know, globalization, you know, the whole supply chain and geopolitical situation. What, what, what this has caused is uh, a situation that's quite different from the past where you have a very high uh, inflation environment uh, where the, the Fed is now stepping in to uh, try to bring it down. And you know their action, uh, you know, has been very fast, very aggressive. Uh, you have seen, uh, you know, the uh, over the course of the year, interest rates going up uh, very quickly. Uh, you have also seen quantitative uh, tightening, where they are taking out about ninety billion dollars of uh, liquidity a month from the market. And what all this is doing is um, resetting the long-term uh, inflation uh, expectations. Uh, long-term uh, interest rate expectations, and this is causing um, you know the markets to behave the way it is uh, right now. So I think um, the the challenge for all of us here in in Asia is um, you know there is uh, an export of all these uh, you know uh, inflationary pressures through the foreign exchange and through the uh, interest rate uh, hikes, and um, you know what the playbook in terms of dealing with their problems is going to be very similar to what we did in the past, which is really hunkering down, looking for businesses uh, in particular that are resilient to uh, inflation, that we have the ability to pass, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, price hikes to uh, the customers, uh, where we have uh, businesses who have the ability to uh, cost cut uh, effectively. Uh, so the playbook in terms of dealing with it is very similar. And I also pass it to some of our other colleagues here to maybe elaborate on that as well. Nanish? Yeah, thanks. So as, as Kenneth said, you know, every crisis is different. This one has been pretty unique in that there's a sort of one-two punch. You had COVID and now you have the war and inflation and all the rest of it. I remember after the GFC, there was this discussion around decoupling. People said Asian markets were decoupled from what was happening in the West. The GFC was a Western problem and we soon found out it was otherwise. Today, we hear similar things about maybe Southeast Asia and India being on their own sort of engine. The reality is that it will get exported. The problem will get exported through the currencies, as Kenneth was saying, and other means. The interest rates will have to respond in our markets. So that is a reality. What's different this time, I believe, compared to Asian crisis or the dot-com bust or the GFC, is that many markets are much stronger in Asia today. 
Um, yes, you have a Sri Lanka and a Pakistan situation, but more hef hefty markets in terms of domestic economies being bigger, uh, in terms of the balance sheets, FX reserves of many countries being bigger, bank balance sheets, which just evaporated in the Asian crisis and even struggled through GFC are much better today. Dollar debt as a proportion of overall debt. So, you know, the, the propensity to just fall apart is much less this time, but it will be tested. It will be tested over the next 12 to 18 months pretty strongly. And so you go back to saying, what is, what is it that we as PE guys will do uh, better this time than we did in the past? Firstly, the base of PE investors, PE capital, which is in Asia, is much bigger now. The amount of maturity in how businesses are run, the governance levels, particularly in the mid-market where a firm of capital plays, is of a much better standard. The last thing I'll say is that, you know, the, these crises really separate quite brutally the strong from the weak, particularly in the mid-market space. And we've been very conscious of that. So during the last three years, since we spun out, we have a base of about 35 investments in Asia. We made 21 bolt-on acquisitions. And that's a sort of game changer for a mid-market company to step away from the pack uh, during a time like this and create strength coming out of a crisis. Teddy, your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, if you look at this crisis compared to the previous one, the GFCs, I think the GFC is... Uh, essentially a crisis that uh, was created because there was over-leveraged um, in the housing market in the U.S., banks were over-leveraged. But this time around, it's quite a different story because um, if you look at post-GFC, the amount of QE that was put in place, right, and also sailing into the, uh, the COVID, the amount of stimulus that was put in place, um, all these get readjusted. Um, when the COVID is finally over. I mean, factors of production was disrupted uh, during the COVID. And when COVID is over, it takes time to put in this, to get back these factors of production again, right? So that adjustments has created a lot of cost pressures, um, a lot of bottlenecks, and therefore we are seeing uh, inflation as it is. Um, geopolitics have also contributed to that. Um, commodity prices because of the war and that further put on pressure on, on, on costs and inflation, right? And to rein in that, you're really talking about um, the Fed's cutting back on purchases, the Fed raising rates, right? Um, so, so that's kind of a very different environment. Uh, if you look back at GFC, it was like basically rates uh, were low. Uh, and they're getting, they, were, they were getting cut. But right now, uh, rates is on a rise. So it's kind of a, a different set of problems that the private equity firms are facing right now. I mean, if you are a buyout firm, right, we have been so used to and so entrenched to a low rate environment for over the last decade, right? And when you do um, acquisitions, of companies, you have assumed that, you know, you put in a ton of debt and rates continue to be low and, uh, and that was the assumption. But right now, given how fast the pace of how rates have increased, I think companies would, 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 would need to look at how do I handle um, the pace of rate rise, right? Uh, the US Treasury has uh, risen from 20 bips to like over 400 bips, right, in a span of like, uh, 18 months, right? So if you uh, are a buyout firm, you would want to be looking at, uh, for example, um, or, or you have growth companies, you take in on some debt, you want to be looking at how do you manage that? Um, you know, should you be renegotiating uh, some of that uh, credit covenants? Um, at the same time, you've had to deal with uh, rising cost pressures, means you got to handle like margin pressures on your business. So these are some of the uh, challenges that in the current state, um, I think companies need to manage. Doug, your thoughts? Sure. I, I think it was Mark Twain who once said, uh, making predictions are difficult, especially about the future. And you know, the reality is that 
there's the macro and the micro. We have a lot of interesting discussions at our investment committee these days around all of the issues that the panelists have talked about, uh, the Russian war, uh, uh, the Ukraine war, uh, zero COVID in China, inflation, supply chain issues. The risks are myriad. They're everywhere. And I think the way we, we try and handicap this is to move away from the macro. I mean, we're not, we're not too obsessed by the macro because it's uncontrollable. What we do, what we do try to do as a firm is, is look very much at the micro. Um, our business is to back great managers um, with half of our capital and with the other half of our capital to find compelling, interesting uh, co-investment opportunities, uh, drive secondary transactions. And really, that's about, you know, as we always say um, at our firm, you know, good performance in private equity is actually very idiosyncratic. Um, you, you can find, even in a very difficult macro environment, managers that can navigate through difficulty and deliver great returns. So even though macro, macro forecasts are important and thinking about macro is, 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 is very important, fundamentally we can't control it, so we then try to really focus on the micro. Okay. That said, uh, PE firms have traditionally performed very well uh, in the years following a down cycle. How are you balancing the caution based on the factors, the risk factors that you've talked about, plus the opportunity to make bold bets at this time? And maybe we'll start uh, you know, with Doug. Um, so the good news for, for a global investor is we can allocate our capital across, across the world. I think the other, the other thing we talk about a lot is just diversification. So uh, right now, there's, there's a lot of money obviously flowing into the U.S., into the U.S. dollar, we have U.S. dollar strength. Um, I would say of all three regions, in some respects, Europe is the one that uh, we, we're, mo we're most worried about and the markets are most worried about in part because of the war on the doorstep of Europe. Um, so LPs are shying away there. But that might, in fact, be creating some opportunities. And we see them actually, you know, particularly in the secondaries market. Um, in Asia, um, again, you know, we're a long-term investor. This is private equity. We need to try and look through uh, some of the issues we're seeing. Um, we may talk about China a little bit more in the panel, but, you know, I think right now in China, um, the reality is that, you know, zero COVID policies um, are really what is holding things back and, and causing people to take a second look. But, of course, there are other second-order issues as well that, that we need to think about. Um, but I would say that, uh, for us, at least, uh, investing globally is important and continuing to invest globally and then, most importantly, diversifying across the geographies. Sure. Eddie? So, so for us, um, we, we look at the PE business as one where we don't get to pick out the vintage. We don't get to pick the nice vintage. Um, Any time is a good time to start a PE firm if you can raise the money. Right? right? Um, so... Typically, coming out from a, a down cycle, you have opportunities, like what Doug has mentioned, you, you, you get to uh, uh, invest at more compelling valuations. Now, I think the, the, the challenge here is you probably can't stop investing even when um, valuations are challenging. You'll find ways to uh, structure your transactions. And that's what we have done as a firm. Um, in, we, we call ourselves the private capital fund in, in our firm. Uh, and the reason why we call ourselves private capital is because um, what's unique about us is the way we structure our transactions. We uh, tend not to be uh, in a space where we are competing with, let's say, uh, a VC or a buyout uh, a firm. We tend to structure our transactions with um, downside protection, credit protection, or some kind of price adjustments uh, simply because we felt that over the last 12 to 18 months, um, before obviously the, the, the interest rate uh, 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 trend starts to rise, uh, was that valuations were quite challenging. Uh, and, and to facilitate an investment, um, we, we uh, started to be a bit more creative when it comes to um, the investment structures that's uh, going into some of the companies that we find will basically prevail over the, uh, the cycles. Because uh, generally, um, it, uh, when you talk about PE, it's long term. And for a typical 10-year fund, you tend to write through 
up cycle and a down cycle in, in any business environment. Um, so if you structure your deep transactions right, uh, I would say even if you had invested in times where um, markets were buoyant, uh, you will be able to ride through the down cycle um, and make money off those, uh, those investments. Nanesh? Yeah, look, I think um, making good returns through cycles means that uh, you also have to take your money off the table when the markets were flying high. Uh, over the last two and a half years, we brought back $1.8 billion and invested six fifty. dollars uh, We thought, you know, markets were uh, floating in a sea of liquidity. It was time to take money off the table where we thought value was overdone. Um, at the same time, we, we're still backing our winners to go through the cycle now. In terms of new opportunities, a number of things happen in the mid-market space particularly. If you look at the listed space, say on the Singapore Stock Exchange, or even in Hong Kong, uh, looking at uh, great, uh, greater China opportunities, which are mid-cap listed companies, they tend to get beaten up too much during a downturn, and they're great to take private opportunities that come up. We've done quite a few of those in Singapore. We were looking at one in Hong Kong as well. Uh, the other thing we do is we've obviously got a pipeline of you know, companies we've been following for a while, but uh, when markets were up, we didn't get a chance to get in. And some of those may be operationally very sound, but have balance sheet issues uh, going into a situation like what we expect to come up in the next two years. And that is when our capital becomes really valuable. We solve a capital structure problem and with a fundamentally sound company and back them to become consolidators in their space when maybe the whole industry is struggling with the same problem. So those are some of the things we think about tactically in, in terms of how to play the, the down cycle. Yeah, and I think, um, I actually, I would say that, you know, the private equity, you know, returns um, generally outperform the market, um, whether or not it's, uh, you know, through a, a, you know, a downturn. Um, but I, I would say that um, if you look at this current downturn, you know, what are, you know, the opportunities uh, here? Um, you know, you have a very uh, structural shift in the supply chain. Um, and this actually creates, you know, opportunities uh, for a lot of uh, uh, countries in this region. In Southeast Asia, you see a lot of um, uh, manufacturers, uh, you know, moving their, their supply chain uh, to Southeast Asia to the rest of other countries as well. Um, you see this um, uh, geopolitical situation between the U.S. and China. And what does that mean? It means that, you know, Chinese companies listed on, in the U.S. markets are, you know, battered down. And there are opportunities to delist and relist it in, uh, you know, in China or in Hong Kong. Um, I think the other thing that's happening is with the geopolitical division, you are actually seeing an uh, increased level of trade between North Asia, China, and, and the rest of Asia. And that has uh, accelerated quite a lot. And that also creates a lot of opportunities uh, for us. The other trend that we are seeing is, you know, on, um, it's on more on the digital globalization uh, trend where uh, you know, you see a lot of, um, you know, IT, BPO services, businesses in India, in the Philippines and some parts of, of uh, South Asia uh, now exporting even more uh, to Europe and North America. And this is really driven because of cost pressures in those countries, where we, which is kind of like forcing them to actually outsource uh, more to, to this region. So net net, I think, as, as you know, the, the Chinese um, uh, saying goes, you know, whenever there is a uh, you know, uh, danger or risk, there's also an opportunity as well. Yeah, maybe talk a bit more about China. Um, how are you viewing that as an investment destination? It's a huge market, um, but are you slowing down your investment pace? Are there certain sectors uh, that you are looking more at versus others? We'll start with you. Yeah, um, I think for China, I think we, we are long-term uh, bullish. I think uh, in the near term, you know, I think we need to see some stabilization uh, of the uh, politics and the policies. I think once we have clearer clarity on that and directionally, I think it would probably end up positive over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, if you look at China as an economy, uh, you know, 1.5 billion people, you know, growing middle class, uh, you know, they have very, very deep capital base. 
uh, I think it would be very foolish to to ignore the, that that market. I think what is uh, clear is the geopolitical divide between US China will continue to grow, uh, and there will be some bifurcation there. But I think you know I think China itself, with its trade with Asia, is going to create its own. Uh, self-sustaining, uh, you know, uh, uh, ecosystem of capital, of investment opportunities, and and growth. And I think, uh, you know, we here in in Asia is um, in Southeast Asia is actually very well positioned to, you know, to play that, and at the same time, you know, uh, benefit from our relationship with the uh, the West as well. Sure, Nanish. Thanks. So, so I, you know, totally agree with Kenneth in terms of the long-term opportunity in in China. Um, Obviously, the immediate term is very volatile. The short to medium term, again, people will struggle with uh, how to read the environment. But some of the most interesting opportunities we see in our pipeline in China are Western companies uh, leaving China uh, and the local operations are being carved out or there are opportunities for the local team to do a management buyout. So those are very interesting situations, which can be quite attractive over the next, say, six to 12 months. And uh, fundamentally, if you, the, the, the thing that I think has rattled people the most about China is, can we really predict regulatory change? Um, and how can I then make a call on a five, seven year horizon if I'm not sure about regulatory change? So one will have to be, conscious of the spaces one chooses to, to play it as an international investor, which really are less likely to be affected by regulation. And um, also, um, you know, as, a, as an international fund, what connectivity can we bring, particularly the China-Southeast Asia angle, where a lot of Chinese capital, a lot of Chinese companies, they're looking for footholds in Southeast Asia, and a firm like ours can actually provide that connectivity. So some of the opportunities we are seeing are of that nature. Um, I think one cannot really ignore China, given that it's the, uh, probably one of the largest homogeneous market in Asia PAC, right? It's uh, probably like 65% of uh, Asia PAC GDP. Um, and um, as much as, um, you know, you like to look at it as like um, there are a lot of um, regulatory um, considerations in China, political considerations, what's happening to the tech sector, what's happening to the uh, property sector. Um, the trend that we tend to see in China is that when there's a lot of exuberance in any specific sector, you tend to see um, the government coming in to basically uh, clamp down and reduce that exuberance. And uh, that's what we're seeing in the tax base. And that's what we've seen in the property sector. So in a way, it's a good thing. It opens up opportunities for private equity investors, for VCs, um, whom in the past has to wrestle with uh, very lofty valuations. I mean, the valuations, quite frankly, was out of this world. Um, the leveraged, in, in the real estate sector, uh, and given how tight those credits were trading, it's kind of mispriced, right? So uh, for us, uh, as P money, uh, we are long-term. So uh, the long-term money would want to look for a, um, a compelling entry price uh, into a market like China. And, and I think what's happening right now um, is gradually evolving into that. Uh, and remember, uh, while the world is raising interest rates, China is actually reducing interest rates. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of make uh, the, the, the place more conducive uh, for growth over time. So does that mean your investment base is not slowing down? Um, no, we're actually um, looking, I mean, during this period, we're actually looking at sectors that uh, are less likely to face regulatory headwinds. For example, the FMB sector in China continues to be a very big market. Um, uh, we have invested in uh, companies in that space. Um, and and, and uh, we continue to do so. And in fact, the LPs that we have interacted with, um, they continue to uh, uh, be positive on China to our surprise. Uh, 
um, even though you, you may hear selectively some LPs would stay, say that, hey, I, I, I don't want a fund to have any uh, you know, exposure to China, but that's kind of like very reactive to specific events that has happened. It has you know, specific investments that they have that hurts them in the public markets. Uh, you get that sort of reaction. But in the private markets, I, I think most LPs to actually take a, a pretty uh, medium to long-term view on, on, on China. Doug, would you agree? I would agree with the last statement, indeed, that you know, private equity is definitely the best way to play the long-term China story. Uh, but China is complicated, right? I think if I can sum it up in a couple of words, it's complicated. Um, we forget that the Chinese private equity industry, uh, as large as it is, didn't exist in the year 2000, right? So all of the growth really we saw was post SARS. That's when the first firms, Honey and CDH, were formed, and, and they were very small funds at the time. Um, and then if you think about it, peak Chinese private equity was you know, maybe starting around the Beijing Olympics 2008, coming out of the GFC. China was responsible for probably half of global growth. Money poured into the country, um, as did LP capital. And returns were quite good. Um, the VC space took off as well. And you know, a lot of people made money on China. But what we would say is that all of the issues that we talk about today, all of the problems that exist in China, they've always been there, right? We, we can start with... Uh, debt overhang in the property sector. Uh, economists were talking about that 15 years ago. It's just that investors chose to ignore some of these real issues. Now, in a risk-off world, people are much, very much focused on, on the, the very real issues in China. But that doesn't mean you can't make money there. And you know, a good example of that, uh, the regulatory, we, we obviously are all aware of the, the regulatory issues. So summer of 2021, uh, Ch Chinese government came out overnight and, and made changes uh, that affected the ed tech sector. So there were a lot of stocks that were crushed, um, including ones on the New York Stock Exchange, um, overnight from a Friday to a Monday. Um, there was a lot of private equity, and, and particularly the venture capital money in that space. Um, some of some P, some P firms got stuck uh, with, uh, with private shares that were suddenly worth 80% less overnight. But there were some firms. Uh, we have a, a, a venture capital firm in our portfolio uh, that owned a company called GSX um, in the ed tech sector. They sold out of that position completely. It was also New York listed very early in 2021. Why? Because the Chinese government was signaling as early as 2018 that they didn't like the fact that all of these ed education tech sectors and tutoring schools were making money off the back of middle class Chinese people. So I think the moral of the story is, you know, partner with people who are local who understand the local context, who have ears to the ground, who are well connected. Um, the other thing I would say is that a lot of the conversations we've been having with Chinese GPs recently, many of them actually are going quite slow right now. They themselves are maybe not concerned about the long term, but they're waiting for a little bit more certainty um, around various issues. And I think the general consensus view that we hear is that a post-March 2023, when the whole uh, leadership transition is finalized, uh, that that would maybe be an interesting opportunity to get back into the market, potentially at lower valuations. Let's talk about the fundraising environment. Uh, can it, BPA just raised $11.2 billion for uh, one of the largest uh, private equity funds focused on Asia. Uh, Doug, LGD closed a $1.6 billion fund of funds focused on Asia. How different was the fundraising environment and did the conversations with the LPs change at all in view of what's happening? Mm. Maybe start with you, Kenneth. Yeah, I think, um, you know, from, from the, LP, I mean, we, we started our fundraising process uh, much earlier, you know, through the COVID uh, cycle, uh, you know, really on the back of a very aggressive investment program uh, during COVID. Um, when things begin to stabilize, I think um, you know. I think it was a, around a few factors. I think around the performance of the portfolio, as you always say, you know, you are only as good as your previous fund. So I think uh, you know the, we had significant boost from our uh, track record from our prior earlier funds. 
Um, I think in terms of um, you know the the, the you know the um, the China question, um, you know I think that, that over the last couple of eighteen months or so, as the geopolitical situation deteriorated, I think there was a bit of that. But I think our peace were able to see through that uh, you know with our pan Asian structure, you know we had the ability to allocate uh, capital. Uh, to other parts of Asia, you know, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and India as well. And even in the uh, China context, uh, you know, there were still uh, interesting, uh, you know, opportunities in, in those uh, markets as well. So ultimately, at the end of the day, I think, um, you know, it's, it's around uh, having the right uh, strategy around, you know, the industry uh, thematic focus, um, and having the right, uh, you know, kind of like a value creation model that you're able to employ in the uh, in the portfolio companies. And I think all these things, uh, you know, kind of like came together to uh, help facilitate our fundraising. Yeah, I would say fairly similar story for us. Um, we 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 had about a twelve month fundraising period. Um, of course, we were on the road less than normal because of COVID, so a lot of it was online. Um, but yeah, I mean, existing investors are obviously very very important. Um, and people who believe in the long-term story, the worst thing you can generally do is miss vintage years, right? So it's one thing to say, I'm going to not, you know, come into your fifth fund, but what happens if, you know, 22, 23, 24 turn out to be the best vintage years in Asian private equity history, right? You've then missed, you know, your overall returns through the cycle are, are going to be much lower. So I think that's one thing we talk a lot about. And then, you know, to, to the same point with bearings, um, you know, our portfolio is, is it's a balanced regional portfolio. So it's very diversified more than a more than a bearings is because we're 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 investing also in managers. So we have, you know, many, many companies in our portfolios. But the fact of the matter is, even if you're maybe not a fan of China at the moment, you know, you have that Indian growth story, you have some of that Southeast Asian growth story, and then you can balance that off with Australia, Japan, Korea, OECD markets, buyout focused, different sort of risk profile. So I think that's the way we approach the market. And, you know, thankfully, our fund was fully, fully closed by April 2022, because actually we've seen the, a, a big uptick in investor concern, specifically around China, um, but also Asia uh, post the close. So I think it's a more difficult fundraising environment now for sure. And uh, Eddie and uh, Nerish, you're currently in the market. So maybe talk a bit more about sure. the current environment. Sure. I mean, um, the LPs are certainly more cautious. Well, I mean, because um, like most capital allocators, they, they see what's happening in the public markets, right? Valuations have plunged um, considerably in uh, many sectors. Um, they, uh, if you go out now with a private equity uh, fundraise, uh, a lot of LPs are interested to spend more time on what you have on your existing portfolio. I mean, for us, when we fundraised um, our portfolio, it's quite uh, meaningfully deployed already. Um, existing LPs do get the uplift in terms of the NAV of the portfolio uh, when they invest in us. But at the same time, they are also spending more time um, scrutinizing what you have in your portfolio. I mean, are these companies ones where they are susceptible to, you know, interest rates um, uh, increase, uh, cost pressures from inflations. And of course, they look at the structure of your transaction, which um, helps definitely if you uh, structure your investment in such a way that it has a meaningful ratchet to adjust valuations. It has a credit downside protection. Um, so, so these are some of the things that... Um, you know, the, the, the LPs would actually look at. Um, and, and one more point that makes it sometimes a bit challenging, even though today we see that a lot of uh, capital allocators are actually increasing their um, allocation to privates. The fact is that when they, for example, like a Korean or Japanese uh, LP, um, when they see that... Um, you know, the public market's portfolio have uh, shrunk in value. And on the currency side, they actually see that uh, in local currency terms, right, uh, the, the portfolio has actually uh, uh, weakened quite meaningfully. 
all this translates to their private portfolio suddenly, uh, inadvertently gets enlarged, right? Because your, your public side of things has dropped, your currency has weakened, and most of the privates are, in, uh, are invested in US dollars. And when they translate back to their local currency, it, uh, without doing anything, they have a much bigger private allocation already. So that adds to the challenge as well uh, when it comes to putting more money into uh, privates. Sure. Um, Nanesh, do you think this will also affect uh, the time it will take to close a fund? Yeah, I think, look, um, there's generally a lot of caution around uh, uh, new, new commitments. Um, also, the fact that, you know, as Joji was saying in his opening address, there's a lot of uh, managers out there. Uh, so what has resonated in our discussions with LPs is, firstly, they want to see a track record of real distributions, DPI. And how has it been over 5, 10, 15, 20 years? In our case, we've been around for 20 years, although we're independent for only three years. But we've had a consistent track record of bringing money back uh, from some of the most difficult markets. If you talk to LPs about capital from India distributions, they'll say, yeah, it's been patchy. You know, we've done that consistently. Similarly with Southeast Asia and, and other Asian markets. The second thing is the discipline. Uh, through the cycles, particularly the last cycle through COVID, uh, when, you know, money was uh, aplenty and some of the more, um, how do I call it, uh, 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 fluffed up uh, business models were, were being invested in. How were you thinking about these things? Did you keep your discipline? Uh, thirdly, uh, team longevity. How long have you guys been doing this? And have you been committed to a particular strategy which has worked uh, for you across cycles? And finally, the ability to show that you have the strength in your uh, business model, the special sauce, which differentiates you. So, you know, in our case, we occupy a sort of white space in the mid-market where very few international funds are playing today. And therefore, the ability to bring international connectivity. So, you know, you have a Korean market which has developed to a certain stage. You see pattern recognition for other markets. You're able to bring that to a portfolio company that becomes a sort of special sauce for you the ability to help make bolt-on acquisitions happen for a mid-market company, which couldn't do that on its own, is something we bring to the table. And of course, attracting talent. When you have a P investor of our profile in a, com a mid-market company, suddenly high-quality professionals feel much more compelled to join a company like that. So those are the sort of discussions we're having with MPs, and that's what's finding resonance. Of course, the challenge is there's so much money out there that uh, how are you going to find the right deals with the right price? And there again, being Pan-Asian, as Doug was saying, makes a difference. You see relative value all the time. Uh, there are some markets which, and this, the correlation is not necessarily there. So that's where I think we, we face some of the most challenging questions. Yeah, I think fundraising environments is difficult, but I think that over the next few years, I think this is probably going to be some of the best vintages we'll see. Um, Nanish talked about fluffed up uh, valuations. How do you see valuations dropping further? You also talked about there being a lot of tri powder. So there is, uh, investors need to deploy that capital. So how's that balance uh, going to come around? Uh, we'll start with you, Nanish. Look, I, I think that is a real challenge. The amount of dry powder means that some companies and their pricing benchmarks will get propped up for a while. Uh, venture debt is another example of where things are going to uh, help in that whole process. But I believe that, you know, if a company really wants to capture the opportunity coming out of this downturn, then they will seek out the right type of capital at the right price because becoming dominant in your space is more important than maintaining artificial marks. We're seeing that happening in many companies where they bite the bullet and say, you know what, it's more important for me to get it right with the right partner than just keep hanging on to um, you know, valuations which are not justifiable anymore. Eddie, hey, do you add? Um, well, I think like you've mentioned, because there's a lot of dry powder um, within the P and VC firms. So, um, and 
uh, mindful that a lot of uh, companies have also raised uh, money right now uh, over the last 12, 18 months. So the balance sheet as in general at this point in time, I wouldn't say it's in a uh, critical position. Um, and because of that, uh, it might take a little bit longer before we actually seeing deals that are compelling to us. I mean, we have struggled with uh, a lot of valuations uh, uh, in, the, in the last 18 months. We were hoping that um, valuations come down in a meaningful way so we could get into some of the sectors like in the healthcare space that we like. Um, and, and we are slowly getting there. Um, it takes time, I guess. Um, but we are not uh, hopeful in the sense that uh, we, we think like valuations will drop in the same fashion as the public markets and, and there, there will be a moment where, you know, we could really buy these companies at a distress. We, we, we don't think that will happen. Uh, we continue to play the game by stru- uh, be, being creative in our structures to uh, continue to uh, make adjustments on, uh, uh, we've given ourselves optionality in terms of uh, entry prices, uh, in terms of uh, downside protection, we continue to, to, to build that into a lot of our investments. Uh, and it's kind of like how we, 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 we play the game. Just, oh. just, just to really quickly uh, add one point, I know we need to wrap up, but uh, one thing that tells the tale is always when the companies are sold, right? And so the nice thing about having a secondaries business is we're constantly looking at different portfolios, global portfolios, Asian portfolios, and, you know, there's certain managers that mark quite conservatively and some that don't. And, you know, in, a, in an environment like we're coming out of right now, you know, we, our sense is there's still a lot of marked up assets, um, but time, time tells the tale. So we like to obviously see companies that are sold at valuations higher uh, than, than the marks in the books. Um, and, and so time will tell.